Okay, thus endeth session one. Guys, I'm a gun nut. I mean, I'm a nut on a lot of accounts, but, but I'm a gun nut. And so I always take my little cartridge collection <clears throat> because we've had five standard cartridges in U.S. military history. This one is a 4570, great big heavy bullet used during our war with the American Indians. That big bullet, if it hit a man in the torso, killed him almost every time. Almost every time. It was a killing blow. The next one is what they call a 3040 Krag, just before World War I. Again, pretty stout bullet, hit a man, an enemy soldier in the chest area, killed him almost every time, almost always instantly. Then we stepped up in power, went to a 30 6 even more powerful, shot the same diameter bullet, chest hit, killed you almost every time. Almost up to modern times, we had a 308. Same scenario. Our military thought that we want a weapon that kills people every time with a good hit. And then some diabolical genius in the 1950s said, you know, it's a lot more effective to wound an enemy than it is to kill him. Especially in the jungles of Vietnam where you could put some pressure on their infrastructure. So we switched to this little bitty 22 caliber bullet and it'll kill a man but a lot of times it won't. A lot of times it wounds him and what happens every time a person's wounded now on the battlefield? What has to happen? Carrie's holding up two fingers. Two or three other soldiers now have to withdraw for the battle to take care of that soldier. Guys, I think it's a beautiful illustration of what Satan would love to do on planet Earth. He'd like to take this nice Christian couple here who have all of the, uh, the, the potential in the world and he'd like to shoot them with a 22. He'd like to make sure that their marriage just never quite works. And that rather than them engaging in the battle and being productive, and, and their friends being able to engage in the battle and being productive, their friends have got to spend a whole bunch of time bandaging them up. Does that make sense? Does it give you a little window why I'm so passionate about this marriage thing? There's a world that needs to be saved. There's a world that needs to be discipled. And the Christian church has been shot full of so many little 22 holes that we're not getting much of that done. Guys, I try to meet with seven people a day. That's about as many as I can do. Two on Saturday, two on Sunday. I do not have an appointment available until the end of May. Sound busy? It's just way too busy, isn't it? Okay, so we're going to learn how not to do that. Turn to page 16. And I'll have you close your eyes. I'm going to tell you a story. Okay? How to avoid a fatal crash. A modern parable about grateful obedience. A young student was on his first flight with his instructor. As they attained a cruising altitude a mile above a large city, the student noticed that the pilot was slumped and unconscious in his seat. The student desperately tried to revive the instructor but was unsuccessful. Beset with panic over his circumstances, the student secured contact with an air traffic controller at the local airport. The skilled and experienced controller quickly assessed the gravity of the situation and in a confident but emotionless tone instructed the student pilot to remove the unconscious pilot from his seat and then take his place at the controls. Son, he said firmly, you are in desperate trouble. If you do nothing, your small aircraft will soon exhaust its fuel and crash to the ground. If you try to land the plane on your own instincts, a disaster will also ensue. But if you will listen carefully to me and do exactly what I say, you can safely land your plane. I know well the runways at this airport. I know the weather and the current wind speed, and I have a detailed flight manual open and in front of me. I have all the tools to get you safely on the ground. All I need is your obedience. The young man was overwhelmed with gratitude at his good fortune and listened carefully to the simple and clear commands of the comptroller. He executed those commands with discipline and precision. It wasn't long before the student pilot taxied to a stop 
on the runway. Okay, open your eyes. Guys, I see this scenario in my office several times a day. A couple in the plane. The pilot's not paying attention. He's slumped in the seat, and that plane is heading down. And there's going to be a terrible disaster. Not only are they going to be badly injured, but there's going to be people on the ground that are injured. Have you ever noticed that broken marriages never just affect two people? They never just affect two people. They certainly affect the children. But any of you that have been friends, I got the last call I got as I walked through the door today was from a friend in Billings saying, would you pray for a couple? They're about to divorce, and I, I've been calling her, and she won't call me back. So is she also a victim of divorce? In order to avoid a fatal crash, will you change seats? Listen to God, godly instruction and carry out those instructions with discipline and precision. If you will, you will discover that God has given us, so this is really meant for my little staff, the tools to get you safely on the ground. I looked at the couple today that was doing so well, and I looked at them and I said, good job. I said, what would you think if you were me and a couple came in ready to divorce, and in three months they turn around and say, we never dreamed we could have such a good marriage? What would you think? And they said, well, we don't really know. What, would you, what, would, what do you think? And I said, I think you're saved. I think you're going to heaven. I think the Holy Spirit of God most high revolves in you. He resides in you, who's changed you and given you the, not only the desire to obey, but the ability to obey. How exciting, guys. But I can see it real early in the game. Will you obey? Flip the page. <clears throat> James Dobson coined the term emotional bank accounts years and years ago. I think it's a very apropos title. Guys, Joan and I have emotional bank accounts with each other. When we do fun things, we bank some chips. When we say nice things to each other, we bank some chips. If I'm curt with Joan, I make a withdrawal. Very simple, isn't it? Well, guys, I believe the crazy cycle is what gets us in trouble. Crazy cycle or the cross in a marriage conflict. An offense occurs through an unkind word, an act of selfishness, an instance of neglect. We've all seen those things, right? And the wounded spouse can either, has a choice now, remember our buttons, they can retaliate like the world with angry words. Then we fight. Have you ever noticed that when we get real angry, we become historical? <laughs> right? You ever become historical? One or both parties detaching and seeking comfort in the approval of others, materialism, activities, sex, drugs, alcohol, etc. Guys, nobody comes to my office thinking that I'm a secular counselor. Nobody. Everybody knows I'm a, I'm a Bible thumper. Do you know how many affairs I deal with each week? Minimum of three. Sometimes as high as five. That's within the church. The crazy cycle really gets out of whack, doesn't it? Notice what it says. After some time, returning to an appearance of normality. And that's the dangerous thing, isn't it? I had a young couple in my office here a few weeks ago, and I asked them how many unresolved conflicts they, they thought they had. And they thought maybe three or four a month. We'll do a little math. Let's, just, let's be conservative. Three a month. At the end of 12 months, you have 36 unresolved conflicts. At the end of two years... 72. Does that sound like a lot of, what would you call it, precancerous cells to you? That's a lot of precancerous cells, isn't it? The couple is primed for the next but even more intense crazy cycle. Eventually their hearts will be hardened toward each other. That's how the crazy cycle works. Now, there is an option, but it's an option to only those who have the Holy Spirit in them, because this one's hard. To resolve in Christ. First of all, a Christ follower is going to do his best to overlook minor offenses. One of the greatest ways that you can assess how you're growing in your walk with the Lord is how easily offendable you are. If you're a real sensitive person who wears their emotions on their, on their shirt and is always being offended, guys, you've got some work to do with Jesus Christ. 
mature believers aren't offended all their time. So it's easy to overlook minor offenses. Number two is to determine to become a peacemaker. Jesus says real specific, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. They speak the truth. Now, this may seem a little contradictory. I've had ladies say, but Fred, if I speak the truth, my husband gets mad. And I always say the same thing. Make him mad. But make him mad for being gracious and being truthful, not for being an egg. There's a difference. I'm not at all upset about making somebody mad. Just make sure you've done it for a righteous reason. Number four is dying to self and loving the offender unconditionally. My arrow, guys, the secret to happiness. Here it is. This is what you paid the big money for. The secret to happiness is this. Self-denial to the point of death is Jesus' secret to happiness. Self-denial to the point of death. Now, you get a, a husband and a wife both living life that way. Man, it can be fun. I love dying on Joan's behalf. And you know what? She loves dying on my behalf. It's a great way to live, isn't it, dear? It is a great way to live, to die on behalf of the other person. Every hunting season, I get a, a lot of calls. Guys call and say, Fred, you want to go pheasant hunting? You want to go deer hunting? You want to go... And, and I love to do that. But... But I don't get enough time with my bride as it is. And so I kind of have a standard response. Can Joan go? Joan likes to hunt. Can Joan go? Guys, I, I'm just not interested in leaving her in the dirt. And you know, at, there was a time in my walk with the Lord where there was a little bit of discipline required. But the truth is, there's no discipline required now at all. I'd rather be with her. So if the guys say, well, no, um, this is kind of a guy's trip. Oh, well, let me know how it works. You know, tell me what you got. Guys, it's dying. On, it's wonderful to die on behalf of another human being. And when you start to now do that for everybody, your spouse, your kids, the people at work, I think you're going to see that this Jesus lived a full life, and he taught us how to live a full life as well. The results, guys of living this kind of life is God is honored. And as you know, that's the only thing I'm interested in. I play to an audience of one. If God is happy with me, I'm a happy camper. Number two is the probability of godly change in the home is enhanced. I think you're going to hear something very powerful from this couple that comes tomorrow. That they began this concept of playing to an audience of one. Because, see, guys, if I treat Joan well with the hope that she's going to treat me well back, I think that's manipulation. And not only do I think that's going to offend her, but I don't think it's going to work because there's going to be days where she doesn't perform very well, in my opinion, and now I'm going to be tipped. So if I treat Joan well because it honors my Heavenly Father, I have no way of being disappointed. Number three is the obedient spouse grows and experiences both peace and joy. Okay, write down a pa passage of scripture at the bottom of that page called Matthew 7, 1 through 5. One of the most important things, guys, that we can understand is the concept of unrighteous judgment. In Matthew 7, Jesus begins by saying, do not judge, lest ye be judged. For by the same standard you judge others, so will you also be judged. And then he does that beautiful thing where he talks about the little sliver in the other guy's eye and the big log in yours. And I have a feeling Jesus used props when he taught. I, I'm guessing he held a great big board when he was doing it. Well, guys, I got to wondering one day, because elsewhere in the text, Jesus talks about making righteous judgments. So I thought, what's the deal here? So I'd like to give you a quick study of the Greek. The word judge in the unrighteous sense comes from a Greek word krino, K-R-I-N-E-O, and it is absolutely hated by God when we do these things. And there are five characteristics to this type of judgment. <clears throat> and this is what gets us into trouble in our marriages. 
First of all, it is quick. If you are making a quick assessment, eh, you're on thin ice. Number two is is mean. It is mean. Number three, it is prideful. It has at its core that I am better than you. Number four is there is always an element of assessing the other person's motives. I laugh a lot in my office, guys, because people say, well, don't you think his motive was to do this? And I always say, you know, guys, I have such a tough time even knowing my motives. How could in the world would I know anybody else's? Wouldn't that be true for you? I have a tough time assessing my own motives, much less anybody else's. And the last one, guys, is always with the, the mentality of writing the other person off, at least temporarily. This type of judgment, guys, is absolutely forbidden by Jesus. Does it make sense? Quick, mean, prideful, assessing of motives, and for the purpose of writing the other person off. Guys, I'm convinced that one of the reasons we don't receive criticism very well is that we grew up that in a way that when people criticized us, we heard the door slam. That if we had the mentality that people really do love us and will stick with us even when they criticize us, then I don't think criticism is such a big deal. And it's why I really recommend that when couples are having a difficulty that they make sure they hold one another's hand. I had a lady the other day that said she had something very hard to, to tell her husband. And I said, sweetie, I, you're about six feet too far away from him. Slide over here. And I said, would you hold his hand? And I said, yeah, you're still a little too far away. Let's get in. And I got him about 14 inches away. I said, now, go ahead. <laughs> it was amazing how tender it came across. And when, he got, when she got done telling him what she needed to tell him, I said, how do you feel? And he said, well, I think she's probably right. I said, do you sense that she's walking out the door? No. Now, what if she'd have said the same thing from seven feet away? Does that make sense? Okay. Flip the page. What Jesus teaches on forgiveness. Guys, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, I believe, is one of his greatest teachings ever. He uses it in, in hyperbole. He gives the example of a man who owes another man a lot of money. There's some discrepancies about it, but I've heard that the number could have been as high as $4.5 billion. Okay? He owes the other guy a lot of money. This fellow looks at him and says, I forgive you. Even though you just want time to try to pay me back, I know you can never pay me back, so I'm just going to expunge the, the debt. So the guy leaves... And rather than being grateful for the great forgiveness that he's been given, he walks out and finds some guy that owes him a day's wage, a couple hundred bucks. And he holds that guy to payment and has him put in debtor's prison. And then the original creditor finds out. And so in verse 32 at the very bottom, it says, Then the master called the servant in, You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master, keep in mind in this parable, the master is God, turned him over to the jailers to be tortured. Tortured. Until he should pay back all that he owned. Guys, the 32 people that have been in my office heavily demonized where they could not function... Would anybody venture a guess as what the, the primary ground for Satan to be in their life was? Unforgiveness. 32 for 32. Kind of a pattern. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you are forgiven. Forgive your brother from your heart. There's a, a nonprofit foundation funded by millions and millions of dollars to study the effects of bitterness and unforgiveness on health. In Newsweek, a little over a year ago, they came out and says, we are reasonably convinced now that the following diseases are caused or can be caused by an unforgiving spirit. Cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and autoimmune diseases. 
Yikes. I'm not sure I can afford to be unforgiving. Can you? How close are we? We're, we're getting there, aren't we? Yes. Fire away. Question. Yes. Uh, I understand a principle of forgiveness, but isn't there also um, some level of just not letting people walk on you uh-huh. and setting boundaries? Could you maybe talk mm-hmm. about that a little bit? Yes, I can. I'm really glad you even used the word boundaries. There's a famous book out b- b- on boundaries. And, and I made a statement, as I'm prone to do, that are big and generalized and get me in trouble. But, guys, um, I think boundaries is a great book as long as you know your Bible really well. If you don't know your Bible really well, that book might cause you a divorce. Wild at Heart is a really good book if you really know your Bible. If you don't... I'd encourage you not to read it. That's how most Christian books are, is we have a tendency to overemphasize a particular thing that we're trying to talk about. And so here's her answer to her question. Forgiveness is mandatory for followers of Christ. We don't have a choice. But forgiveness and trust are two different things. And so one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and I'm very glad you brought it up, is Numbers chapter 5, 5 through 7. And I get a charge out of this. I get a real charge because, guys, not only does this have practical application personally, but it's the, it's the basis for our punitive damage laws in the United States. Numbers chapter 5, 5 through 7 says, Moses was to tell the Israelites, if a man or a woman sins against another in any way, how broad does that sound? Pretty broad? In any way, he is guilty, and he must confess his sin And then he must make restitution. And then he must, anybody know the last part? Add 20% to it. So guys, as a follower of Christ, I have no option regarding forgiveness. And I'll define that here shortly. I have no option. I must grant forgiveness if I'm going to receive God's forgiveness. People say, well, that's not true. And I say, well, I don't know what Jesus says then in in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. What's it sound like? Sound like forgiveness is mandatory? Okay. But trust, restoration of relationship, has to do with acknowledging guilt, right? Right? acknowledging that restitution needs to be made and making restitution, in other words, bringing the person back and then adding 20% to it. So I had a young man in my office a few months ago. He had cheated on his wife again, second time in their marriage. He's in tears, just beside himself. I'm going to lose my wife. And so I looked across at him. I said, well, that wasn't a good thing to do. We need to kind of reevaluate where you are with Jesus. And he said, Fred, is there any chance I can save my marriage? And I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Restitution plus 20. And we took him to that passage, and he said, well, what's 20% look like? I don't know, but I bet it's big. (laughs) What do you bet? You suppose it's big? Yeah, it'll be big. But he could win his wife back if he'll try. But that's exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? Is that there are people who offend us, that we now need to forgive, but if they're going to win us back into relationship, now the ball's back in their court. Does that make sense? Okay. Flip the page. The next page, Christ followers are ambassadors of reconciliation. That's homework. Wonderful passages of Scripture. Page number 20. We're going to read real quickly. But at the top of that page, I want you to write the following formula. This may save you a lot of Prozac. (laughs) Offense. So, mathematic parenthesis. Offense plus anger. Now another mathematical parenthesis. So you have a, uh, within parenthesis, offense plus anger times self-pity equals depression. Guys, I've seen lots and lots of depression come through my office, and I understand it can be a chemical imbalance. I can understand that, guys, it can come from external circumstances. But I'm going to tell you, statistically, depression has two major causes. One is we don't drink enough water. Isn't that crazy? 
They figure about a third of our depression is because we don't drink enough water. And then a good portion of it has to do with that formula. An offense plus anger times self-pity equals depression. If forgiving is so important, we really need to ask the question what forgiveness is. There is great confusion on this matter today, and therefore we must first understand what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness does not mean that we will cease to hurt. The wounds are deep, and we may hurt for a very long time. Just because we continue to experience emotional pain does not mean that we have failed to forgive. Forgiveness has nothing to do with feelings. Forgiveness does not mean that we will forget. That's, that's humanly possible. I can't forget on demand. That would do violence to our rational faculties. Helmut Thilke, a German pastor who endured the darkest days of the Nazi Third Reich, says, one should never mention the words forgive and forget in the same breath. No, we remember, but in forgiving, we no longer use the memory against others. I'd underline that if I were you. Forgiveness is not pretending that the offense did not really matter. It did matter, and it does matter. And there's no use pretending otherwise. The offense is real, but when we forgive, the offense no longer controls our behavior. I think I'd underline that. The offense no longer controls our behavior. Forgiveness is not acting as if things are just the same as before the offense. We must face the fact that things will never be the same. By the grace of God, they can be a thousand times better, but they will never again be the same. Make sense? How close are we to getting the tennis ball thrown at me? Within a minute? Okay. We're going to put five items right on that page, guys. <clears throat> Here's a summary of biblical forgiveness. Okay? Biblical forgiveness is an act of will based on what Jesus has done for you. So it is a choice. Number one, forgiveness is an act of will. Number two, is you make a determination not to bring up that particular offense again. Now, this becomes problematic if the person does the same behavior again. Now you've got another issue to deal with, right? But I'm talking about one that has gone away. They're not doing it. If we've forgiven, we don't get to bring it up anymore. Number two, is we don't get to bring it up with any... Or number three, no, we don't get to bring it up with anybody else either. So we don't gossip about it. Number one was forgive because Christ forgives us. Number two was we won't bring it up with that person who offended us. Number three is we won't gossip. And then number four is we ask God to change our feelings. Because he's the only one that can do so. Guys, if you flip your page, there is a piece of very important homework. When I have a couple come in who says they would like premarital counseling, I say, guys, as long as you're willing to do a couple of pieces of homework, I'm willing to do it. This is the first thing I give them. I want them to go and get square with everybody. I have an Etch-a-Sketch screen in my office, and I usually hand it to the girl, and I say, now, quickly, girl. Write the word life. And so she panics and she, and I said, now, as soon as you screw up life, I want you to let me know. Well, she goes like four or five seconds and she, guess what? She screwed up life. <laughs> and I said, now, on an Etch-a-Sketch screen, what do you do? You shake it. Well, God's got a couple of shake kind of verses. First John 1 John 1.9 says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we get right with the Lord, and then we do our best to be right with the person that we offended. So this forgiveness list is very important. Now, is Tracy here? Okay, Tracy, the CD about getting square with your parents, is that out at the table? It's in a bag in the back. I can have that. No, that's just great, but they'll have that before they leave tomorrow. Yes. Okay. Guys, there's a CD with a sermon. Pudgy Ball Guy delivered the sermon about a year ago, and it's about getting square with your parents. It's not the world's greatest delivery. He's not that good a speaker. And there's lots of us and us and us in it. But the basic principles about getting square with your parents are pretty profound. And I, I'm going to give that to you as a gift, and I'm going to ask that you listen to it. Whether you think you've got problems with your parents or whether you think your kids have problems with you, it'll be useful. 
So we'll have that available, and I think we're, thank you, we're at a break. <laughs> See you in 10 minutes.